Okay, so good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Good day. How are we all doing? It's a beautiful day. It's a bright afternoon over here, actually. Uh, if it could be raining where you are, it could be cold, it could be foggy, it could be really, really chilly cold. But thank you for joining uh, us today on the Meetup and the .NET Accra Meetup. Uh, today we have with us uh, the program manager for .NET, director of program management on the .NET team. Uh, he's uh, one of the coolest cuts I know. Uh, his name is Scott Hunter, and he's here today to share with us all about .NET 5. Uh, .NET 5 is the newest .NET in town. Uh, so if you've been coding for a pretty long time, you probably know of .NET Framework 1, 2, 3, then .NET Core came, then .NET Framework. Now .NET 5 is the new baby on the block, and it's really awesome. Scott will be telling us all about it. But before we get right into the show, uh, I would like Scott to just say hello and meet our listeners. How's it going, folks? <clears throat> I am super excited to be here today. It's, it's uh, um, I think I told Frank, of, Frank and I actually had a phone call a few weeks ago, and I was telling Frank that I've not been to Africa since 2018. Um, but I'm happy to be back and at least virtually talking to all the .NET developers in Africa. Uh, yeah. And so. Yeah, thanks for that, Scott, and welcome. Uh, so here on the call today, here on the stream, uh, we have all the .NET leaders, community leaders from across Africa. We have from Ghana to Togo, Cameroon, South Africa, Nigeria. Well, I'm joining in from the UK, but I mainly focus on the .NET communities in Lagos, Nigeria. And um, before we get right into that, uh, let me just introduce community leaders. So right here, we have Frank from Ghana. We have Sam, also from Ghana. He's currently not with us now. Then we have Kojo Laurent from Togo. Then Abisoye Falabi from Lagos, Nigeria. Pivred and Nike from South Africa. I from Nigeria, but currently in the UK now. Then we have Damien from Cameroon and Michael Dera from Zambia. So that's every one of us. And I am glad you're joining us today. If you have any questions at all at any point in time, feel free to dub them in the comment section. I uh, will get to it and answer them. It might be when Scott is talking or a question about .NET comes to your mind. Just put it up in the comments area. We will see them and answer them. So uh, welcome from Liberia, from all around the world. Thank you, Aiken, for joining. You've been super awesome. Uh, so, uh, so I'll go on now and hand over to Frank uh, to give us the virtual meetup blob and introduce us to what .NET Foundation is and how to get started with your own virtual event. In case you're thinking of starting something just like this, Frank, adding over to you now. Hello, Frank. Are you with us? Did you lose Frank? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. So I would like to just talk a bit about um, the Donut Foundation and the virtual meet, uh, the virtual user group that we're using right now. So basically, the Donut Foundation is. Um, is, is, is a foundation set up to drive .NET technology. So most of these open source technologies that you've been seeing are all coming from the .NET Foundation, and they are being supported by um, other companies like Microsoft and all that sort. And currently, we are coming to you live via the .NET Foundation's virtual meetup group. So this was um, a discussion started um, somewhere on the .NET Foundation's GitHub channel on how to create a virtual user group so that everybody or all .NET communities in the part of the world can be well represented and can have um, a good audience when it comes to um, when it comes to Meetup. So just to highlight a bit on that, that is streaming right now. So the virtual Meetup group allows uh, allows com as community leaders to create events and have a good audience broadcast and as you can see we are broadcasting from the we are broadcasting from the .NET foundation channel so that's just a little bit of blurb i like to talk about the .NET foundation and the virtual meetup yeah all right thanks very much for that frank 
And now, not to waste too much of your time and to get right under the show, uh, if you've heard of the lesser Scots at Microsoft, this is one of them. The other one is Scott Anselman. I remember when I was learning how to code then, we used to watch a lot of build videos, a lot of .NET videos. And let's discuss lesser Scots. I never knew today will come where we'll be talking with them live on the show. So I hand over now to Mr. Scott on to tell us all about .NET 5. Mr. Scott, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Comically enough, uh, we have .NET Conf coming up in about uh, two weeks. And uh, at .NET Conf, we're going to have the two lesser Scots, myself and Scott Hanselman, plus the big Scott, Scott Guthrie, all together at that conference. So uh, come join us at uh, .NET Conf in about uh, two weeks. And uh, we will do that. Let me share my screen here. OK. There we go. And we'll start up. Um, so first off, just want to say welcome, Africa. Um, first time I've ever ever virtually spoken uh, in Africa. Um, I, as I said earlier, I've, I've been in Africa in 2019. I visited Tanzania and I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and had a great time in Africa. And I hope to come back soon and, and bring my family with me, actually, once this COVID thing is over. Uh, but let's get, get right into it. Uh, so .NET 5. Uh, .NET 5 is the next version of .NET. Uh, you know, if you followed us along, uh, we've had .NET Core uh, 1, 2, and 3. Um, and what we decided to do is, with, instead of doing a .NET Core version 4, we jumped right to 5, uh, and, we, and we dropped the core name. And that's because in the .NET world, you know, we have lots of .NETs. We have .NET Framework, we have .NET Core, and we have Xamarin. And our, our job is actually to... Uh, over the next year or two is to merge all those together into one single unified platform. And so, you know, .NET 5 is a bigger version than 4. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that our .NET Framework users realize this is the future and, and come here. And so um, I'm going to highlight a couple of the, uh, the the bigger features that we have in, in, the, in the product. Um, one is single file applications. Um, we actually shipped this feature in .NET Core 3.1. Uh, but it's had some some big enhancements in .NET 5, and I'll talk about those a little later on. Um, tons of investments in Blazor and uh, microservices space, and I'll talk about that in a little bit later as well. And we've uh, for Windows Desktop, we've added we've added, added support for uh, full full designer support, meaning that now uh, with .NET 5, uh, if you're a WinForm developer, you get full access to uh, the designer, meaning third-party controls work there. All of our controls are there. And we've also brought click once back uh, because it was one of the most requested features after shipping .NET Core 3.1. Uh, we've added new support for new flavors of operating systems. So um, we've been shipping a version of Windows that runs on ARM64 for about a year now. And now we've added support for .NET uh, to run on that as well. So you can actually build native applications for Windows that run on ARM64. Tons of perfect perf improvements, uh, C sharp nine, F sharp five, lots of stuff going on there. So we're super excited about uh, the the new bits coming out in about two weeks. Um, <clears throat> people always ask me how you know how are we doing in in the uh, is .NET doing in the world, um, and I'm super happy to announce that we have over two million uh, .NET Core developers now. And I realize we only ship .NET Core in 2017. So it's in, in about three years, we've actually added 2 million developers, which is super cool. Um, if you look at uh, the Stack Overflow, they do a developer survey every year. And we are the number one most loved framework two years in a row, 2019 and 2020. And ASP.NET was one of the most loved web frameworks as well. So uh, super happy, happy, happy about that. And then, um, you know, we open sourced in 2014 which six years ago, but that's very late compared to things like Java that, that open source probably six years before that. Uh, but we are one of the top 30 um, highest velocity OSS projects. Um, top five language on GitHub. Uh, we are the number one uh, product in, in Tech Empower, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Tech Empower is a public benchmark. It's one of the core tenets of .NET Core has always been to make me the fastest framework you could ever use. Why should you use .NET? Because it's the fastest. Um, so let's talk about that. So the adoption, um, .NET All Up, we now have over 5 million developers. And, you know, as I mentioned before, we shipped WinForms and WPF on .NET Core 3.1 in December of last year. Um, and we're, no, we're 
almost in November of this year, we've, we have 200,000 of those developers that have moved from .NET Framework to .NET Core. Um, just last month, just, just last month, we added 230,000 brand new .NET Core developers. And these are people that never had actually used .NET Framework before. So this, this, this is just showing the, the rapid growth of .NET Core. And then we've had over 2 million publishes to Linux from .NET Core, showing that that cross-platform technology we built is super important to people. Um, in the case of, of .NET 5, when it comes to either WinForms, WPF, or Blazor, we have tons of our uh, third-party community uh, and, well, third-party commercial and third-party community people that have actually built uh, libraries for this. You can see DevExpress, Infrigusix, Telerik, Radzen, GrapeCity, Syncfusion have all got controls that work on .NET 5 and Blazor. So check those out. And even cooler is um, the open source community has really uh, embraced all the work that we're doing in .NET Core and .NET 5. And so this is a few of the many examples of, of third-party libraries uh, that are there, like Blazor Strap, Blazor Eyes, Blazor, Blazor Extensions. You can see that Blazor has, has generated an entire ecosystem of, of open source communities that, that work on top of it. Uh, and there's plenty more here as well. Uh, I mentioned before Tech Empower. This is showing, um, and you notice I have a to-do here, make the chart prettier. Um, this is showing the performance, raw performance of .NET Core. And you can see that in the Tech Empower benchmark, you can just, just Google Tech Empower, and you'll see that ASP.NET Core is the fastest framework period across all, all of the, the technologies. And this is one of our core, core goals of .NET Core is to actually be the fastest framework out there. So our, our reason to use .NET is it's just the fastest. Now in .NET 5, we've gone through and worked on increasing the performance across all of all the benchmarks in Tech and Power. And so you can see for plain text, we're up 38%. Um, with, our new, with our new JSON library that we shipped in .NET Core 3.1 and from other improvements, we've increased our Tech Empower JSON performance by 42%. And the hardest uh, benchmark in uh, Tech Empower is Fortunes. That's a web page with an API backend, uh, microservices are running in, inside of it, it's doing all the stuff. Uh, we're up 20% and we're, I, I think we're technically number seventh when the next round of Tech Empower comes out. But this is the showing that, you know, our, one of our core reasons of using .NET, Core, .NET and .NET Core is performance your apps will be smaller, faster uh, as you go. Um, this is more performance improvements. We took socket performance on Linux and it's 30% faster uh, on 5.0 versus uh, 3.1. JSON serial serialization, I mentioned that on the previous slide a little bit. We've increased that performance 20% over .NET Core 3.1. If you're doing collections uh, of, of large, large, large collections and arrays and serializing them, We've improved that performance three times, and now we we're zero alloc, which means you don't allocate any memory, and that's where our perf performance comes from. And then my favorite one here is gRPC, which to me is the replacement for WCF. It's contract-based APIs. Um, you're, no you're gonna notice here that we're faster than Go, C++, and Java. Um, and this benchmark we ran here is actually something we ran in our lab, and it was run right before uh, we, we are gonna RTM. We think that we've actually caught Rust here as well, and will be the fastest framework on the planet uh, for gRPC across across the boards. Um, and when does desktop development? You know, you might say I'm a web developer; I don't do desktop anymore. But the reality is, we have over two million people doing desktop development today in .NET every single every, every single day, and we've done a bunch of a bunch of new things in .NET 5 for this. So first off, we brought WinForms and WPF to .NET Core in 3.1. And with .NET 5, we have completed some of that journey. Uh, WinForms and WPF designers, fully enabled. Um, we have added, the, the biggest feedback we got in, after shipping .NET Core 3.1 was people want to click once back. So we brought it fully back, which means you could take your WinForms or WPF application uh, and make them have an installer that makes them just work. We've added all the third-party uh, uh, libraries to the designer now. So you can take a Telerik, uh, library, it'll show up in the WinForm Designer for the first time ever. Um, and then cool, one of the other cool things is because it's .NET Core slash .NET 5, you get all the features we've added, which means if you want to build a, a, a desktop application, 
you can make it a single file. That single file contains .NET and your application. No .NET has to be on the machine at all. Um, you also get uh, modern new controls. You know, we've, we've been shipping this new Edge uh, that's built on Chromium, and that's now going to be available to .NET Core developers, .NET 5 developers as well um, with, with a WebView 2. So lots of new enhancements for the desktop for um, .NET applications. For mobile development, um, you know, Xamarin is a library that we that uh, uh, is a company we bought a couple of years ago. It enables you to build native iOS, Android applications with .NET. Um, and we're currently in the path of actually migrating Xamarin into .NET 5 slash .NET 6. It'll be in .NET 6 as a .NET 6 feature. Um, but even outside of that feature set, uh, we've done a whole bunch of new work in, in Xamarin Forms 5 uh, with uh, uh, new, new support for brushes, shapes, and paths. Of the things here, the, the thing that really I think enhanced is, is the most exciting is hot restart, hot reload. Um, and it's all about making the, your productivity with, dot, with, with .NET and, and Xamarin faster than ever. And so what hot restart, restart and hot reload do is, you know, you build your application in Visual Studio and you want to copy to your mobile device. Well, copying stuff across a USB cable to a device can take some time. Uh, it might take 5, 10, 15 seconds. Uh, with hot restart, hot reload, you don't have to do that anymore. Basically, you change the application in Visual Studio. We take a diff of the change you made, ship it to the device, um, and then it launches immediately. The other cool thing about hot restart, hot reload is, let's say you're going to develop on an iPhone. Well, can you use an iPhone with Windows? Yes. So for the first time ever, you can actually just plug your iPhone into a Windows machine. Uh, do not put any developer tools on it. Do not have a developer license, you can just basically plug it into your Windows machine, press Control F5, the app will go to your, your iPhone instantaneously. Um, and then once you change the app in Visual Studio, it'll refresh on the iPhone uh, within just a second or two. Um, and so we're continuing to make uh, that development process for building these mobile apps better. Um, this is kind of kind of exciting. Uh, this is a video that we're gonna show in a, in a few weeks. Uh, so the Oscars, um, they have a new application all built in .NET. So if you're a movie fan and you ever watch the Oscars, uh, they have a brand new app that they're launching that's all built in Visual Studio and .NET. Um, and it's a Xamarin application. Uh, and so it'll launch on iOS and Android. Um, and it's completely .NET. And it is how all of the stuff they do for the Oscars and, and will we'll, we'll be done this year. So super excited about that. Now let's talk about Visual Studio real quick and we'll start some demos. I'm just trying to get through the slides real quick. Um, so in two weeks at the launch of .NET 5, we will launch Visual Studio 2019 16.8 uh, and there'll be a preview of 16.9. Uh, it's gonna have .NET 5 included in it. Um, it's got a brand new experience for Git. Uh, if you're using Git as your, as your uh, source control, much better experience. It's got Linux debugging and that's one of the things I'm gonna show in just a second here. Um, and it's got also support for GitHub Actions. This is really exciting to me as well, which is I can basically uh, take a .NET project, have it in Git, uh, pro preferably in GitHub, obviously. Um, and then if I want to publish it to the cloud, you know, you could right click and publish. Well, now we have a feature where you can right click and add a GitHub Action uh, that will set up CI CD for you. And then when you save or commit, you know, changes to your project, uh, that will generate a build in the cloud and put the application into Azure or wherever you want it to go. Um, and that's built into 16.8 as well. So let's let's do a couple demos. Okay, so the, the first demo I wanna do is I wanna talk about that Linux uh, capability that I just talked about. So what I'm gonna do here is open a project and this is a ASP.NET Razor page project. And um, you can see what it does here is basically it has an, it, on the main page, it writes out the OS version. So if I just run this, oops, no, 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 no. Stop. Getting ahead of myself. Okay. If I run this, um, it does what you would expect. Now it's going to be complaining to me. Mad. OK. 
Okay. We'll do this. Okay, so there it is, it boots up in Kestrel. And obviously uh, I'm running on Windows and so it prints out the OS version, uh, Windows NT 6.2-9200. Not super exciting. Um, now what's cool here is I can close this out and this is a new feature that'll be in the 16.8 tech. Um, and I'm gonna change the drop down here and notice that I have a new option here, WSL2. So WSL stands for Windows Subsystem for Linux uh, version two. I'm gonna select that. And now I'm on a Windows machine, but I know in the cloud, I'm gonna publish up to a Linux container. Well, I wanna develop on Linux. Well, but I'm on Windows. Well, I just selected WSL2. And now when I run the application, same experience, you can see the uh, Kestrel boots up and now I'm running on, on Unix. So, and you notice that performance is about as fast as it was in Windows before. I don't have to uh, have a lesser developer experience. My developer experience is amazing uh, running right here on Linux. I can put a breakpoint in here and I can press F5. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna launch the application in the Windows subsystem for Linux. We're gonna attach the debugger to it. My breakpoint hits. So basically on a Windows machine, you can develop on Linux natively. And that's one of the big features that we have in the 16.8. And I'm super excited about it, which is, you know, develop on whatever platform you want, how you want. And so that is uh, one of those features. Okay. Um, web and cloud development. This is obviously our, our biggest area of, of, of .NET. And let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so Blazor. There's a cool, uh, when we ship Blazor in 3.1, um, uh, it has support for what we call Blazor WebAssembly. Blazor WebAssembly is where you can actually run your entire .NET application inside the browser. So you can actually write C Sharp in your pages of your web application and we actually run it in the browser. Um, we did that in .NET Core 3.1 using Mono, which is the same technology we use to run um, iOS and Android with Xamarin. Um, Mono traditionally runs against the Mono PCL. Uh, that's the base class libraries. That's string, date, all the all the types and stuff that you use. Um, well, we have now moved Blazor WebAssembly to use the .NET Core BCL. And so even though it still runs on top of Mono, because Mono is our version of .NET uh, that can run on um, small devices, iOS, Android, we also use it for WebAssembly because it runs a, a smaller version of the, of, of the framework, uh, but it's now built on the same BCL that .NET Core was built on. Um, and so it means the compatibility with your existing NuGet packages is higher. Uh, it's three times faster than the, the Blazor WebAssembly that we had in 3.1. Um, and it supports server-side pre-rendering and lazy loading. And what this means is when a Blazor application starts up, you know, we don't want to have, have it have to load all the assemblies and stuff. Uh, before it starts writing on writing the screen, it only loads what it has to, and background loads the rest of stuff. So it means your application will start faster. Um, you can see it's three times faster all up, and it's got more support for the existing libraries that we have. Um, it's got other cool features such as component virtualization. This means, let's say you want to have a Blazor application, and you want to have a million million rows in a grid view. Well, now you can. The million rows will only paint the first ten and will lazy do the rest of them as you scroll into the end of the thing. Um, one of the challenges you have with any web tech is you start using controls from those open source uh, components or those control those, those control vendors I mentioned before. Um, we wanna make sure all those things don't overlap each other. And so now we have CSS and JavaScript isolation. So they can call their CSS files the same way or they can call their JavaScript files the same way and they won't overlap. So there's a whole bunch of features in Blazor for five that are, that are better. Um, we have this awesome company called Postage, um, and they actually built their entire brand. They're, they're a startup on .NET, um, and they built their entire application with Blazor uh, and Azure. And uh, it's, it's cool for us to see startups like Postage uh, build on top of our new tech. Um, now, this is where I get excited, um, cloud native. So we've all heard of, you know, microservices, containers, gRPC, uh, Kubernetes. 
what is .NET's answer to this? And so we have a ton of stuff here. And so let me just let me just dig in and show a few of these things. The first one we have here is we have REST APIs. Um, and we've done a bunch of cool work in .NET 5 around REST APIs. So let's go launch Visual Studio. And I will select, let's do, let's do this one. And before I th th this loads, I'm going to launch another VS real quick. And I want to show a new experience. This is brand new in .NET 5. And I have my machine set uh, in a weird mode, so my my uh, file new is kind of slow because I'm I'm previewing a new feature we're going to ship um, next year. But I'll select a ASP.NET Core Web API, and name doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to change this drop down to be 5.0. And when I did, notice this new feature showed up. Enable Open API support. Um, this is a new feature in five. Um, and let me show you what that does. And you should turn this on. It's on by default. Um, and my app here has this turned on. And so with web, web APIs in .NET 5, we've added support for what's called Open API. And what that means is I've got a simple API project here. Um, it's got a controller here. And that controller basically has a get method that returns some random weather. Uh, so traditionally, if I if I ran a um, a web API project, the the browser would give it be, would give me a, a 501 or something like that because there's no UI in the application. So you know, Control F5 F5 experience isn't great. Well, in this case, it's very different. This because this is a 50 project, and I selected that Open API. If I look here, that means that I have a new dependency. This is included by default, Swashbuckle ASP.NET Core 5.5. So that means when I run my Web API project, now I get a new experience. Notice my application starts up and we go to this awesome page. And this page goes and says, here's the APIs in your, in your project. And there's weather forecast. I can press get. And right from here, I can try it out. And I can tell it, do I want uh, text plane? Do I want JSON? Uh, I can, I can kind of hint to what I want. But when I press execute, it's going to go call the API. And you can see the weather coming back here. And shows, it shows me the response. So we're making building APIs even easier. Now, you just saw me click around here. It's kind of cumbersome. Um, so this, is, this might not be their best experience, but I can show you how we can make it even better. So up here on this page, I can also click this link. And this is the actual raw swagger that describes my API. And this is, this is useful for us. I'm going to save that here. Yep, replace it, please. So I'm going to save that and show you how we can use that in the, in the future. So I'm going to close that out. I'm going to go back here. And because of, we have that REPL, I mean, we have that um, um, because we have that that swagger, I can do some really cool things. So let's let's see what we can do here. First off, let's go and change this to set this as my startup project. Um, and I'm going to go down here and change my browser. And I have this new option, HTTP REPL. And with that, I can I can select that. And now, if I run my project, and so, instead of launching the browser, I get a command line interface. From the command line interface, I can type dir. Ah, there's a weather forecast. I'm going to cd into weather forecast. Now, inside of the weather forecast, there's a get. I can just type get. And there's my, my weather data. This is super cool from the standpoint of being able to debug. Now, I can control F5 directly into the REPL and just type get call the API. I could have a breakpoint running in Visual Studio. Calling get in here would cause the breakpoint to fire. And so you can see we're doing all these investments to make building APIs even better in .NET. Um, another feature that we shipped in 3.1, uh, but we've made better, um, primarily because of the fact that the uh, swashbuckle is in by default, is client generation. 
So I've got this weather API, I'm gonna call it. How would I call it? Well, let's check this out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come to my solution, I'm gonna right click, I'm gonna go add, new project. And I'll select console application. And we'll call this client. Next. Again, we're doing 5 today, so I'll select 5 And this is a feature that we shipped in 3.1, but it's better now because now that the swashbuckle is enabled by default, it means all of my projects support this. I'm going to right-click on my project, and I'm going to go to Add, and I'm going to select Service Reference. And notice that it has uh, a couple of options here. The one that's most important to me is Open API or GRPC. I'm just going to say Add. I'll select Open API, and now it wants a uh, Open API service reference. So I just happened to you saw me save that earlier. Go to my download folder. I'll select the Swagger.json that I, I used, and now I can select um, Finish. And this is very similar to what we have had in WCF, where we could take a, a WCF server and write a client for you automatically. We can now do the same thing for um, writing a web API. So what I want to do is I want to I make my client uh, console application be able to call that web, web API. And so I can just go right here to the, my application, and I've got a uh, right here. And to call that API, because I've done that 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 uh, that right click, add the reference to the web API. Now I can just control dot. I want my method to be async. Perfect. And so now all I have to do is new up an HTTP client. I new up that brand new uh, thing I generated, the Swagger client. And now I can just call my API client dot weather forecast async. So I didn't have to write any code to do all this. It's all, all written for me. Um, we had a bug in the previous preview, and I'll see if the bug is still here. Let's go look and see if the bug is, is still here. This Normally, I can go here and see generated code. Yeah, this is all the code we wrote for you when I did that right click. You don't want to write any of this. You just want to be able to call your API as a method and not think about it. So there you go. Close that out. Um, and let's just try this out. So I'm going to put a breakpoint here. Um, I need my application to start up both the server and the client. So let's run multiple projects. We will boot up the server first. Um, and we'll boot up the client. Uh, and we'll do that. And I should be able to F5 now. And you can see how fast I was able to actually go. There's the API running. There's my client running. I go back to Visual Studio. There's my breakpoint. New up the client. I can make the API call. Then I can loop, basically loop through and write out each result to the screen. And so you saw how fast it was for me to take an API and then call it from any other .NET project. Um, and so we're super excited about this. Now, there's also some, something else we introduced. And let me open up a project for it as well. We introduced uh, in 3.x gRPC. And so if you're a fan of WCF, um, the, you know, REST is amazing. Uh, but we all know that the, the coolest part about REST is REST works across um, a variety of tech. Um, it's just it's just JSON results, and so you can call it from an iOS device, an Android device, Windows, IoT, whatever. Um, but one of the negatives of it is it is text, um, and so it it means when it goes when it gets it goes over the wire, HTTP will double the size of it because it'll be encoded, um, and so you won't get the best perf. Um, and so there's a new tech that we introduced in in 3.x, and it's called gRPC. And the way gRPC works is it's got a, a, a couple other cool features as well, which is 
it's contract based. It's very, very similar to WCF. WCF, you had strong type, you could put objects on the wire um, and it just worked. The negative of WCF was WCF was a Windows and, and .NET kind of only technology, which meant if you built a WCF server and you wanted to call it from iOS or Android, good luck. Uh, you could try to find a SOAP library or something like that. Uh, but gRPC provides all the same func functionality as WCF, but gRPC is completely cross-platform. Uh, it runs on uh, cross-platform and cross-language. So it runs on all the platforms, Windows, iOS, Android, whatever. Um, but it also runs across languages, which means I can create a gRPC service in .NET, call it from Java, call it from Go, call it from Python. If you have an existing gRPC, gRPC service in Python, I can call it from .NET. So it's a cross technology. Uh, technology. Uh, in this case, the, the way gRPC works is you have to write what we call a proto file. And the proto file doesn't use C Sharp or any, any .NET languages because it's cross language technology. And so it's got its own format. And you can see here, I've got the same weather API I wrote in REST. And in this case, I have it written inside of gRPC. So I've got a response, it's got a timestamp, a temperature in Celsius, a temperature in Fahrenheit, a summary in string, um, not hard to write. Um, and they're, they're the, they're the method is where you pass in nothing and we return a stream of weather. So um, now what's cool about gRPC is I write this one file and then just like I showed before, I right click and I will, um, be helpful if I did the right click in the right place. I right click and I do an add and I do a service reference again. And um, what happens is from that, I can basically create a server. And, and I've already done this in this case, I point it to that proto file. And what we do is we generate all this code for you again. This is a bug we have, this will be fixed in the, in the final release. It doesn't know how to find the file correctly. Um, but we generated a bunch of code for you automatically. And I can actually show that. Yeah, I think we stuck that. Where did we stick it? Yes. So you can see this is the code we generated for you automatically. You can see we generated 16K of, of code. Um, but in this case, I write the proto file, I right click, I add a reference, I tell it to build me a server, not a client. And then all I've got to do is it will generate this code right here, weather base for me with all this goop that I once again don't want to write. And then all I have to do is I, I take this and I, um, overwrite it, and I write my method that returns my weather stream. Now, once again, we want to make gRPC super easy to use as well. And so I can do the same trick I showed you before. I can come here. I can right click, add new project. We'll add a console project again. We'll call this one client as well. We use .NET 5. Now I want to I want this application to call that same gRPC service, so I can do the same kind of thing here. I've got a I don't know why I have breakpoints living here. We'll do a snippet again, um, and this looks a little different in gRPCC. Let me just control that myself to success. And it wants one more here because it wants the method to be async. There we go. So just give that a second for IntelliSense to, to click in here. Um, and so for gRPC, it works a little differently. Uh, the, the first thing, oh, I made this mistake previously before. Let me just do this again a little bit. So I had this this Hello World um, application, and I jumped ahead of myself. Uh, if you remember on the on the Web API thing, 
I need to right click add and I'm going to select service reference again and I'll click add open API gRPC this time I'll select gRPC and I will select a file and we know that I need that proto file that's the magic file that tells us how the API works I'll select that this will then add the NuGet packages and it will generate the client code for me so I can call that uh, directly from the project. There we go. Now I can go back uh, and you can see it's made some stuff for me. Um, I can go back to my application here. And now, can control that ourselves into success. Um, much happier. There we go. Um, and you can see that the way this works is one final one. Um, I basically have to give it an address of my service. I then new up a client. Um, and then what I do here is I uh, request a stream. Uh, this is a feature of gRPC that's actually a really cool feature. Just complaining. Um, it's using, a, it's using a, 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 a new feature that we have in gRPC, which is we call this a stream, which I don't have to just call an API and get a result back. I can get an asynchronous result that keeps pumping data back. So imagine you call something and weather keeps coming and every five minutes, a new request just kind of comes in. Uh, and so I can sit there and loop through this and read this. And this should just work the same way as we did before. I should be able to right click over here, um, set startup projects, do the same thing. We'll start the service first. We'll set this one to start up with that. And if it's a perfect world today, I can run this. Build errors. I'm not going to fight this. Um, uh, it's probably because I, I messed up and, and did the action earlier. But you can see writing a client should be just as easy as writing a server. Now, I want to I want to jump out and I want to show uh, one more thing. So one of our goals in .NET Core 3.1 is to make smaller services. And so let's go back into Visual Studio. And I'm going to show you a 3.1 project. And then I want to show you a 5.0 project. So here's a 3.1 microservice. Here it goes. And this is the smallest microservice you can write in .NET today. Um, it's pretty small. If you look at it here, it's roughly 22 lines of code bunch of usings, it's got a program, it's got a static void main, um, and it news up a, a, a builder, and uh, this is kind of a Node.js style application. It runs this code here saying, hey, when you call this, do that. Um, run it, and it just says hello world. Um, now, let's take this application and I'm going to show you a feature that you might not be aware of that exists in 3.1. I can right click on this project and I can do publish. You know, like, why would you publish locally? And in my case, I'm publishing to a folder. Um, so I don't have to publish to the cloud. I can publish locally so I can copy the application somewhere else. But what I want to do here is I want to show you some features you might not be aware of. If I click edit and I go to settings and do final publish options. There's a few things here. Number one, this application is called, it's self-contained. A self-contained application is an app that you, where you build a .NET application, a .NET Core application that does not require .NET to be on the machine at all. Um, by default, this selects to what we call framework dependent, but self-contained means the app is completely self-contained. It does not require anything on the machine. It means also that you can upgrade the .NET on the machine and this app will stay on the, on the .NET it's built on. Now, I've checked another file here, produce a single file. So by default, self-contained builds you a folder with a bunch of DLLs in your application. 
But by selecting produce single file, we now produce a single exe. You can take that one file, copy it to another machine, and it will just work. But even cooler, I've also selected trim unused assemblies. Um, and this makes a this, this means we take the your application, we take .NET Core, we merge it all together, and we re then remove all the .NET Core that you don't use. So, um, and then if I click Publish, which I'll do here, um, you'll see it'll, it'll take a little bit of time because we're going to go make that single exe. And I'll open this up in a folder here. While that runs, go to bin, release, at core 3.1, Publish, and you're going to see a single exe here. Let's wait for it to finish. On the 5.0 one, I won't I won't do the actual publish thing because it, it takes a bit of time. It's ba it's mainly the trimmer that takes a little bit of time. Uh, 10.14. This should update to 10.31. The second here, but these features you might not be aware they exist. There we go, uh, 1031, and so I end up with a a 45 meg microservice. Doesn't sound bad to me actually. Um, and I said this this app contains everything. Uh, your machine needs nothing on it. I double clicked it. Uh, notice it takes a takes a lot uh, took a took a took a, a little bit of time to run this, but once it runs, and imagine in a microservice world. I just take that 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 single file, copy it to my server, and I'm good to go. I don't need any .NET, nothing to go. Cool, runs, great. Now let's do that again. Let's do that with .NET five, and let's talk about what's different in .NET five. Now I know that that uh, Mads came and talked to at this at the same uh, meetup uh, about a month ago or, or a month and a half ago, um, and talked about C sharp nine. Um, this is an example. This application is going to use a little bit of C Sharp 9. So let's go back to the other Visual Studio. This microservice, you know, was 22 lines of code. Well, now this microservice in .NET 5 is 16 lines of code. But what's cooler is, notice there is no uh, public class uh, program. There's no class here at all. There also is no public stack void main. A new C Sharp feature we have called Top level programs lets me just write the write the app. I don't need that class. I don't need that stack void main. Well, the tech should be smart enough just to go, hey, just start writing some code. So I just start writing some code. And so the goal here is to make the microservice kind of app as small as possible. And you can see that here. Now, I've done the same thing in 5.0 that I did for that 3.1 application. I go to publish. I did publish to folder. And I set the same features. I've got my self-contained. I've got my produce single file. I have my trim unused assemblies. Um, but in the case of 5.0, we've improved all this as we do. So I'll open a folder in release net five publish. And what I'll do here is I'll put this over here and I'll select this one over here. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm showing you each of these side by side. Take a look at this. It was 43, 45 megs in 3.1. It's now 21 megs in 5.0. So we've made the self-contained application even smaller. Now, as well, if I go to the 5.0 folder here, let's launch the application the same way we did before. Look how much faster it started. Um, the 3.1 tech actually had to unzip the, the exe into a folder and run the folder. In 5.0, we just run the app directly. So it's much, much faster. Um, and so this lets you build WinForm, WPF, ASP.NET applications that are single file, super small, uh, don't require .NET on the machine, and we think that's a huge improvement uh, in the space. So let me close these out and uh, do one more demo. Um, so I showed you here, I showed the REST APIs, I showed the gRPC, I showed smaller microservices, single file applications, top level programs. I showed the 
develop on Windows with Linux. Um, the next thing I want to show is Project Tie. It's probably my favorite favorite feature we're working on right now. And so um, Project Tie is this. You build a front-end application. .NET's great at building single apps. It's not great, uh, and our tools are not great for building multiple apps at the same time. In, in, a, in a microservice application, notice here I've got a front end, I've got a bunch of bunch of back end services. Well, how does that front end find the back end? Ty is going to solve that, and I'll show you. That back end might depend on something else, like SQL Server or Redis or whatever. Ty lets me define that, and it, it takes care of that for me as well. Um, and then I want to run locally all those all those multiple projects. Well, I showed you before set set up set startup projects. I can do multiples. It's not great. Um, and I can't run on Kubernetes. Um, and then I want to publish this app to the cloud uh, with telemetry. So let's show this. What I'll do here is I'm going to boot up VS Code. And I've got a multi-part application here. And and my, my, my joke before about saying it's not easy to run these on .NET today is I can go source back tie. Um, I might do something like this today. Go to my uh, back end. Do a .NET run. Open up another tab. And here, um, you know, as I said before, Booting up these multiple projects is kind of messy. Uh, it's all loaded. Um, and when I try to run it um, here, there you go. App is running. Great. Uh, that's a cumbersome process. Now let's show you, show you how we can fix some of this process in Thai. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch VS Code. And I've got my, my multiple projects all running and going. Um, and what I'm going to do is instead of doing .NET run, I'm just going to come here and type pi run. Now, um, pi is pretty cool. What it's going to do is it's going to go find my front end project, my back end project. It's going to boot them all up. Um, and even cooler, here we go. Let me select this one. Let's see if it finds it. There it goes. Um, notice in, in here, there's a new feature called Dashboard. I'm going to click the Dashboard. And for the first time ever, when I have a multi-project.NET application, I don't just see an empty browser or something like that. I now see both my applications running side by side. Here's my front end project. Here's my back end project. Um, I can view the logs for both projects. There's the log for the front end. Here's the log for the back end. Um, I can go see the performance counters for each of these projects. If I click the front end here, I see all the metrics that we generate uh, for a running project. You want to see how the garbage collector is doing? Go for it. I can select the back end. So imagine if all your .NET projects, when you're doing multiple projects, microservice style to application development, you get to see this new dashboard where you see both the front end and the back end. I can see the ports everything is running on. And I can click this and it fails. And it failed because it doesn't, the, the front end application doesn't know the proper port of the back end application. Well, let's go fix that. Um, I'm gonna go add, add a uh, NuGet package here. Uh, this is tie extensions. This will be built in by the time we ship. Save. Store. Uh, I'll go to my startup CS here. And notice that I hard-coded the URI and the port, as you would. Um, but this port's going to change when I run it locally. It's going to change if I give it to you to run your machine. It's going to change when I put it in the cloud. So what if I comment that out? I comment in this right here, where I can basically say, get service URI. I just call it by name. .NET will do all the port mapping and, and all that stuff for you. It'll figure out the IP address, it'll do the, the, the mapping for you. I press save. 
Um, I'm going to go back to the terminal here. And I should have actually done tie run dash dash watch. Um, this will mean that Ty will keep watching uh, as the app changes and it will change things. There you go. You can see it doing, it's doing a watch here. Um, good. So I can go back to my browser. I'll restart the dashboard. And now, of course, the project should work because now the front end knows how to find the back end. I'm good. Great. Now, let's add, let's add something more to this. Um, I will stop it one more time. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do, I'm going to do Ty init. There we go. And what that's going to do is that's going to create a file for me. Tie YAML. And notice what it is, is by default, you saw that dashboard automatically knew about my front end and my back end. Well, it did that because in memory, it built its own mapping of the front end project is this. It points to this CS proj. The back end is this. It points to this CS proj. Well, I'm going to change this now. I'm going to go and say, I want my application to have a cache. And I'm going to add a Redis cache. And normally what would happen is when I add a Redis cache, I would go out and manually install Redis on my computer. I don't want to do that. Um, what I want to do instead is I want to come here. I'm going to grab a little bit of text. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to paste this in here. And in this case, I'm going to add a new service called Redis. And instead of calling it a project, I'm going to give it an image. And this is the Redis image in uh, the Docker Hub, uh, which is the place where Docker containers are. Docker, uh, I think and you give it a port and all the stuff to start up. So, um, so let's for fun, we'll do a tie run again. Now, if you know anything about Kubernetes or containers or Docker, you realize that add, I just added a, I added a container to my, to my application. And I didn't write a Docker file. I don't, don't really care. Um, but I can go back to my dashboard. I can refresh. And now you see my two projects, my two CS proj projects. And there's a new entry here that's a container. So Ty automatically knew that was a an image from a container registry and went and downloaded it and booted it up. And I'm good to go. And once again, I can click here and see the metrics on that. I can click here. I can see the logs for that. Pretty cool. Um, so I'm gonna press Control C here and stop that one more time. And we'll go back to my project file. I'm gonna add a package. This is the Microsoft Extensions Caching Stack Exchange Redis. Uh, it's a package that, that, that enables Redis for, for .NET. Um, I'll add that. I'm going to go add some code here. This takes the Redis cache and dynamically injects it into dependency injection. So it can be used anywhere in the application. And once again, I don't specify connection strings. I just call things by the name. No ports, no weird stuff. I'll go to my index CSHTML and I'm going to add a tag helper here. It basically says take all the markup in this application and cache it Go back and show you that. I'm going to say cache it for five seconds. So now I should be able to come here. Now I should be able to do a tie run again. There we go. And now if I refresh my dashboard, I click my front end. Now I'm pressing refresh in my browser. Notice that the time all change, all the, all the temperatures stay the same. Five seconds, you can see that cache is there running. Pretty cool. Now, what if I wanted to actually mimic the real world? I know when I'm done, um, I'm going to run this application in containers in the cloud. Well, I can do something else. Tie run dash dash help. And notice there's a feature here called dash dash docker. So I can do tie run dash dash docker. 
And this tells Ty to run all of my projects in containers. Once again, I didn't write any files to describe that. Ty does this for me automatically. Um, it's all booted up here. Um, I go back to my dashboard, I'll refresh, and now every application is a container. I can click here. Application runs just as it did before. Interestingly enough, it's running on Linux on Windows because uh, it's running inside of those Docker containers. Um, and then the final piece of this is if I wanted to, I can come back here and I can, I can do tie, I'll do a tie dash dash help. One of the features of tie is also deploy. And I can do something tie deploy. I'm not actually gonna do this. Um, and what Ty would do here is it will, it's going to go look and it's going to tell me I can't, it can't find uh, kube control because I don't have kube control set up to, to point to a, a container or, or a Kubernetes in the cloud. But if I had my machine pointed to a Kubernetes cluster in the cloud, Ty deploy dash I would actually deploy my application, all those pieces, the Redis cache uh, and the two backend pieces uh, together to the cloud. And so uh, um, Ty is, we call it an experiment at this point. Um, but it is the future. Uh, we'll, we'll take all this tech, we'll put it into Visual Studio, uh, and all those features I just showed you will work in VS just the way they worked uh, from command line and inside of uh, um, VS Code. I want to quickly close out on one final thing, and .NET 5 is the beginning of a journey. Uh, today we have .NET Framework, .NET Core, and we have Xamarin. We really want to get to a mode where there is just one .NET. Um, and we, we call this the .NET 5 to 6 wave. I want to have one single SDK. You download .NET SDK, um, and it's one component. It's got one BCL. Same, you know, part of this already happened. We took the mono BCL, removed it for Blazor applications. We'll remove the mono BCL for Xamarin applications in .NET 6, um, and then we'll take the Xamarin projects, and they'll use the same project system with those simple CS projects that we use for all the other .NET Core applications. We want to have awesome cross-platform native UI. So we want to make sure that you can build, you know, Xamarin applications uh, that run on Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. We want to have awesome cross-platform web, web UI. This is Blazor and ASP.NET. Uh, you, you, we want to have awesome cloud native investments, meaning if you want to build microservices, containers, I showed many of this today, small size, single exes, build on, on Windows, run on Linux, um, you know, using Ty, build multiple projects, run them in the containers. Uh, we want to have, you know, continued in improvements in speed, diagnostics, and services. Uh, we think it'll, be, it'll make .NET the best breed of, of solutions for all, all modern workloads. Um, now, where we are uh, going to be is .NET 5 is going to release, as I said, in, in, uh, on November the 10th. Um, and you'll see here that we'll have .NET 6 in November of 2021. Dynet 7, November of 2022. We're trying to be very consistent. It's very easy for any any, any developer to understand when the new version is coming. Um, and then notice that each of these releases, some are LTS and some are not. Uh, LTS is long-term support, meaning you get three years of support. Um, but the goal here is, uh, you know, every other year is an LTS. You can stay on that for three years. But we'd still prefer you to really just stay on the newest version all the time. We're going to make it even easier to move version to version. Um, and I said, .NET 5 uh, GA will be November the 10th. Come get it then. And with that said, thanks for joining today. I'm super happy to be broadcasting in Africa. And uh, please you know, try out the .NET 5 bits. If you haven't already, you can try them now. If not, try them out in a few weeks. Um, and thanks for having me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Scott. Thank you, thank you very much. That was an awesome, awesome, awesome session. I just kept um, before I, you know, before I turn on my camera, I was just thinking, whoa, this is like a lot to put to put together in just one session. I mean, some of the things you talked about could actually be, you know, split into an entire, you know, a whole day session on its own. But that is very um, interesting to know all the cool stuff coming in .NET. Um, whilst you were, you know, going, I did have a couple of questions. If you don't mind, we can take the Q and A now. And I shared that if you wanted to ask any questions, I posted a link on YouTube in the chat so that we can actually know what the top questions are. 
so we don't have to repeat questions. Some of what I already asked her. So uh, the first thing that I, uh, the first question I want to pick today is um, someone is asking that with .NET five being a move to one .NET, does it still need or do we need to think about .NET standard? So I was I was reading the questions too. I was going to say yeah, we we still .NET standard is still super important, and it's important because um, you know .NET framework is still around, um, and so .NET standard is the way to if you want to interoperate, if you want to build a class library that works on both .NET uh, framework and .NET Core, uh, .NET standard is the way to do that. And inside of Microsoft, we have many large teams. I'll give you an example of a large team: Exchange Server. They are moving to .NET Core, um, but they have hundreds of projects maybe I, I maybe it might be even thousands of projects and they can't just move them all to dotnet core at the same time um so what they're doing is they they first dotnet standardized everything uh meaning most of their tech can both run on both dotnet core or or dotnet framework uh, but it's, mm -hmm. it's still super important for sharing code across uh both of the techs maybe five years from now when everybody's on dotnet 5 dotnet 6 dotnet 7 it won't matter as much but it's still super important today Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, the next question is, running on the Windows subsystem for Linux, does this only work on .NET 5, or you can do this on .NET 3.1? You can do it on .NET 3.1 as well. So uh, um, the, the the Windows subsystem for Linux is a, is there's an extension. Uh, the extension is available today. You can actually go to the uh, uh, extension gallery in Visual Studio and search for WSL, and you'll find the extension today. Uh, we plan to put that extension in the box, you know, in the five time frame. Awesome. This is another interesting one. So it's asking that will WinForms, okay, built on .NET Core be cross platform? And That's a question we get all the time, um, and uh, it's a it's a tough question. The answer is no. And the the reason that that, that WinForms can't run cross platform is the way WinForms is actually written. It's a very thin wrapper on top of HWind. Um, HWIND is the Win32 window capability. Um, and so basically, WinForms is a very light wrapper on top of the existing Windows technologies. And so you'd have to port um, Win32 to Linux or Mac to make that work. I also like to tell people all the time when I hear this, because I, I hear this all the time, do you really want an app that looks like a WinForm app running on a Mac? It would be <laughs> that's, a good, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, what I would really tell you to do is, you know, look at something like uh, with Blazor, you can build what we call a PWA. Uh, that's a progressive web application. That's a web app that can be installed as a desktop application. Um, that's one option to, to build cross-platform UI. The other option is a Xamarin application. Xamarin does work on uh, Windows and, and, and Mac as well. Not It's, it's not just iOS and Android. Um, and so you can build a Xamarin Forms app that runs on all the platforms. Awesome. I think this is uh, this is a question that a lot of us share, uh, which is uh, they're asking, when are we going to get ahead of time compilation to be able to create native libraries with C sharp? Because sometimes, you know, I don't know, I don't know what your what your take is on that, but this will really be cool to know. Oh, it's 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 a it's super super important to us as well. So it's we think this is a journey. So um, if you're if you're building a iOS or Android app, um, you might not know this, but those are actually native apps. Um, iOS does not let you run a jitted application on the on the phone uh, or tablet or whatever iOS is running on. Um, and so we're using, we use the Mono AOT to run that application. If you build a Blazor application in .NET Core 3.1 or 5, that's also an AO AOT app. Um, we AOT it to WebAssembly. Um, and our hope is in the long run, that we'll actually be able to give you the same AOT tech from Mono for applications that run on Windows or Linux as well, and it was originally our goal was to do that in five, um, but it was it was just too much work. We did get Wasm or, or Blazor to run on uh, Core BCL uh, on top of Mono, um, and you, I said I said earlier we plan to get Xamarin running on Core BCL on on Mono in the in the in the six O time frame, um, and so you might be able to actually run your WinForm WPF. ASPN app on Mono plus Core BCL in the six six wave, um, but the other thing on on AOT um, is we want to make sure that all your apps still run. And so the the, the big thing we're doing and we're going to do in six O is we're going to give replacements for uh, reflection emit and stuff like that um, 
that lets you build apps that are safe to be AOT in the future. So I think mm -hmm. AOT is just a journey and we'll get there. Awesome. So and this, this is more like a personal question. So something I've realized, a trend, it looks as if GitHub actions and everything on the GitHub ecosystem is getting a lot of features. And I don't hear much being talked about, you know, Azure DevOps. Is it something we're expecting that down the line in the future, GitHub is going to be that universal, you know, DevOps solution for all the Microsoft ecosystem? Is that what's happening? I, I think that's the long term is, is that, uh, you know, Azure DevOps won't go away. TFS will not go away, obviously, because there's, there's huge footprints of, of developers there. But I, I do think we think GitHub Actions are the future. And that's why you see that investment, um, you know, as I said, in uh, VS 2016.8, uh, we have GitHub Action support for all your .NET projects, um, which I'm super excited about as well. So, but I think it's the long-term future because it's it's an open, more more broader ecosystem. You know, if, you, if you just, just Google GitHub Actions for .NET and you will see all kinds of crazy stuff up there. There's, there's GitHub Actions that will take, a, yeah. take a, a project and publish it to NuGet.org. I mean, yeah. there's, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So this is—I'm sure this is uh, this is coming from, let's say, backward compatibility, compatibility, and some from legacy code system. So we are asking that uh, Olufemi Olufawubi is asking that will RDLC, you know, be coming to .NET five, or is it going to be an alternative, you know, to use in .NET five? RDLC. What is that? I think it has to do with the report 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 building. Um, you know, back in, you know, okay, yeah. Like, yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> so, so the alternative to that is um, Power BI is the alternative to R RDLC. Um, we will not, the, the team that builds RDLC hasn't, my understanding is they've moved away from the legacy RDLC for a long time now. Power BI is the future. Um, we will have a blog post coming out in November or December that talks about the migration path forward for RDLC. Um, but it's not a, you know, RDLC is not built by the .NET team. That's built by the reporting team inside of Microsoft. And they're moving more to a web uh, space than, you know, the, that, that tech, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, awesome. So let's talk about Project Thai. I have a couple of questions on Thai. First off, when are we expecting Thai? Thai will be in .NET 6. So, um, it, you know, if there's some people have noticed that we've kind of slowed down on Project Thai. Um, mm -hmm. There was we got some feedback just this last week. People are like, "Is it dead?" Uh, Project Thai is not dead at all. It's basically we we stopped everything to go ship .NET five, and so the last month or two, the entire team has been focused on the uh, drawing the bugs down and getting .NET five ready to go. But uh, Thai will ship in .NET six, um, and we're doing the, we're doing a lot of work right now in our .NET six planning to figure out Thai. Like for example, we need to, we need to make the multi project run capability in VS better. And so we're splitting mm -hmm. that capability out of Thai and pushing mm -hmm. it to the tools. Um, but yeah, Thai will ship in .NET 6. Awesome. So a quick one. Um, so there, someone is asking here that, can they use Thai to set up an infrastructure to run end-to-end -end tests? Thai to set up infrastructure to run end-to-end -end tests. You could, yeah. OK. So what are we expecting for Project Maui and .NET 5 in the future? So Maui, that's interesting. Um, uh, for, for Maui, um, I would say wait until December or January, and we'll make an announcement about Maui. There's a whole bunch of exciting stuff that we're doing in .NET 6. So we originally thought that Maui was going to be something we would ship in .NET, .NET uh, 5 or 6. Maui is probably currently slated for .NET 7. Um, but we're going to take a big jump in .NET 6 uh, to bring a bunch of the MAUI capabilities to all .NET developers. So, um, but just give me a month or two. Is once we ship .NET 5, we'll start show talking about our client strategy. But I, I will tell people we have an amazing cross-platform native UI client strategy coming in the future, um, and you'll get some of that in .NET 6, and you'll get the remainder of it in .NET 7. Awesome! 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 Well all too soon from my side <laughs> uh, this has been an interesting session for me and i'm sure all you guys watching from all over the world also had a good time with this i mean for me i'm expecting can't wait for you know all the good stuff that's coming 
Um, this time, Dara, I'm going to hand this over to you, my friend. All right. Thanks very much for that, Scott and Sam. Uh, it's been an awesome you know, view into what .NET 5 has to offer and to see the nice capabilities and awesome stuff you can do with it. Improvements from .NET 3.1 to 5.0 and even what comes in the future. Uh, I'm not sure if Frank is still here or if his internet needs to upgrade to .NET 5, but uh, I'm just going to wait about five seconds for that. Uh, Frank, are you there? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so it seems uh, Frank's internet is not that up to par. So what happens next is uh, after the Q&A, uh, I guess it's a good roundup to say, Oh, yeah, let's talk about the .NET Foundation. Frank is here. Uh, so I think I will do that on your behalf. I have the slide on my machine. So just give me a moment while I get that up. Uh, I'm just going to get the screen up now. I'll do actually my screen again here. Okay, I got it. Share screen, that'll be screen number two. All right, so uh, Dave, you can try to put the screen on. All right, thanks very much for that. So the .NET Foundation is uh, it's a group of individuals and organizations coming together to make the world a better place with the use of technology oh can you hear me now i guess i was just rambling around so yeah the dotnet foundation is uh, a group of individuals and organization coming together to make the world a better place with dotnet it's independent of microsoft uh we have big organizations that are part of this and you might be asking where do i get information about uh dotnet uh foundation you can go to the website at dotnet foundation dot org and then of course you might also want to get information about joining a user group or starting a user group so what you can go ahead and do is go to the link showing right here on your screen that's meetup.com slash dot net virtual user group so let me actually just go ahead and open that up so you can see what that looks like in the browser so i'm going to bring that up on the second screen here So this is what it looks like. We have a lot of members. So it's part of the .NET Foundation that has 372 groups on that. So it's comprised of all the .NET user groups across the world. So I saw a question on YouTube that was asking, how do I not join the .NET uh, Foundation or start my own .NET user group in my country, in my community, in my school, in my church, anywhere you know, start this from? If you go to that link, that's uh, madeup.com slash .NET, dash virtual dash users dash group will place that in the comment area on youtube so you can follow that link straight up you would be able to see uh so this is the current events we're actually running right now i can see upcoming events past events and see and join whichever one you want to think uh do we have a feedback form i'm not very sure of that but of course you can drop your comments on youtube if you have any questions at all uh, we'll get right to them and try as much as possible to answer you. All right, so I guess that's it from this end. Uh, and I would like to hand over to Sam to do the honors of rounding up. Awesome. Thank you, Dara, for that interesting and final piece. Well, all too soon, we've come to the end of another awesome, awesome session like Dara mentioned. If you're not part of the .NET user group in your local area, please find one to join. If there isn't any, you can start your own .NET user group, you know, meet up, and then you'll be added to you can, you can apply to join the foundation and also um, sign up to be part of this uh, virtual event. Um, as you can see from the calendar, we have series of events lined up all the way to the end of the year, all the way into next year. So keep posted, um, check, the, check the meetup, uh, check our calendars. Uh, be checking our you know pages uh from linkedin to the meetup to all the you know the, the other uh, meetup pages so whether you are in ghana you are in nigeria you are in africa anywhere you are in the world uh make a date with us next 
Um, oh, now he finally joins us. The man that needs to have his internet upgraded to .NET has joined. So um, stick with us. I will be really honored and be really grateful to have your feedback on this session, what we did, what we didn't do, well, so that we can actually, you know, make it better and better for you um, as this project progresses. Um, I think from my side, that'll be it. Uh, if Frank has any last words to add, he can probably give us the closing benediction and then we can call it a wrap. Mr. Odom, can you hear us? Well, it looks like the, is buffering again. <laughs> yeah, so, so it looks like France. Um, the first thing we just asked France is going through a COVID check. It has to wait for about three days to make sure that it's safe before it can go through France internet. So um, I'm sure he's still waiting and muffing. Well, anyways, um, we won't uh, take much of your time. It has been an awesome session. Please join us for the next one. And then <laughs> join us for the next session and have a great uh, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you find yourself. Stay safe and have a good one. Bye-bye, guys.